You are listening to This is Oklahoma, hosted by Mike Hearn, telling stories of Oklahomans and those that have made it their home. This podcast is presented by the Oklahoma Hall of Fame, telling Oklahoma stories through its people since 1927. Follow them online at oklahomahof.com and definitely on Instagram at oklahomahof. Let's get into today's episode. What's up, guys? Welcome back to another episode of This is Oklahoma. Mike Hoon here, your host, back with another episode down at the Oklahoma Blood Institute today uh, with my guest, Mr. Ron Black, to talk about uh, the importance of the Oklahoma Blood Institute, uh, both personally and obviously professionally, because you work here now, and just all the other cool things that goes on. Uh, And, I mean, just finding out you have a background in radio show and talk radio, (laughs) so now I'm jealous. I want to know all about that. Oh, boy. I mean, from the outside, it seems like so much fun, but from the inside that's not easy. Well, it's so. not. It, it's, and the radio business these days is incredibly fickle, and and it's all about cost. I, the radio business has to compete against podcasts like yours, yeah. has to compete against uh, Apple Music and Amazon Music. And, and so it's a tough business. It absolutely is. And being yeah. a former talk show guy, um, it's it's cost effective to just do syndicated radio right so that's what they do now well it's so easy for me isn't it to show up with a pelican case set up and you know some of the radio guys do the same thing they, they don't need much um, no it doesn't require a you lot, know it's just just content that you need right because especially if you're doing it daily like you that's need stuff right. to talk about <laughs> you have got to have content god which is i'm so glad that i'm on like the host the, the guest and hosting interview style because if i had to talk for an hour twice a week I'd, I'd struggle to find content. there was one time I had a three hour show and there was one time that uh, I did somebody had called in and we were talking about food and that kind of thing and somebody had called and said hamburger meat and I just kind of went off I said it is not hamburger meat it's ground beef it's it's hamburger, okay? Yeah. And I did a three hour show <laughs> on the on the grammatical error of of hamburger meat, and and even to this day, somebody will hit my Facebook page and just for the fun of it, say uh, hamburger meat, and I'm like, oh my uh, god, you don't call it fish meat, do you? You know, hamburger is a type of beef, anyway. Don't get me started on that again. Yeah, because I can see we could easily talk a long time about that. I mean, I get it. It makes total sense, doesn't it? But you're right. People right. people do say, oh, yeah, it's hamburger meat. Well, it's not. <laughs> That's just what you use it for. Right. Uh, but I guess all the way to the start, um, born and raised here, kind of wanting to, uh, to be in kind of media as a young, from a young age? Well, actually, I grew up in Seattle. Oh, and, wow. Okay. Uh, yeah, I joined the Navy. I'm a Navy veteran. And uh, I moved here. Um, back in 1998, and I was involved with uh, the Trinity Foundation doing um, affordable housing for transitional, and they needed someone to be as a liaison between mm-hmm. the faith community and and uh, the private sector and, and do some media kind of things as well. And uh, how I got involved in, in radio is I had written this article about the MAPS project, mm-hmm. and it was published. I, I did some work with the Gazette as well. I think I was their token conservative, but um, at the time anyway. And I had written about how the folks involved with MAPS, you know, both sides weren't being intellectually honest. Mm-hmm. And so next thing I know, I'm on the radio with uh, Carol Arnold, as a matter of fact, talking about it. And the next week, she got sick. And they asked me to fill in for. Well, the next thing I know, I've got my own radio show on WKY, doing the afternoon drive from like three to six, and it just kind of spiraled from there. <laughs> but but uh, I had my own hunting and fishing TV show, Wild Oklahoma. That was my TV show. Uh-huh. Um, and then fast forward to 2012, I got really sick, and I w- was seeking care at the VA hospital. And I had gone in, and they told me that I had a diabetic-related liver disease. Uh-huh. And uh, I had four units of blood in my stomach. I was bleeding internally. Yeah. And uh, I did everything that they told me to do. So, obviously, fast forward to 2012, and I was at the Nazi Zudi Transplant Clinic, and my I had gone from about 230 pounds down to 140. Yeah. So I was very, very sick. Um, I went in for what was supposed to be kind of a routine procedure to in, in, install a, a stint or a shunt in my um, uh, bile duct to keep the bile going. Yeah. And something went wrong, and I needed a transplant immediately. And... 
I was, you know, fully admitted. I was put to the top of the transplant list, and I was going uh, downhill very quickly. Right. And one liver came in that was not a good match. And then a couple of days later, there was a second liver that had become available, and that also wasn't a good match. Mm-hmm. Well, the third liver, I think the next day, was a good match. Um, And I didn't have very much time left. If that liver hadn't come in, I I wouldn't be here. Right. Um, So being the difficult kind of person that I am, most liver transplant surgeries take about six hours, and, and you'll use maybe five to six units of blood during the transplant. Well, mine took 13 hours. I had two transplant surgeons. Uh, I had two vascular surgeons there. They couldn't figure out why I wouldn't stop bleeding. Well, I ended up taking 59 units of blood and blood products. Jeez. Um, one of the things in transplant that they don't tell you is obviously they have to wipe out your immune system uh, in order for you to, your body not to fight against uh-huh. the new organ. And, and when I woke up, I was in the ICU and I was hallucinating <laughs> and, and I, there were chickens all over the floor, just chickens walking around and, and I was just tripping. And I thought, see, I, I had interviewed the folks from Westboro Baptist Church on the radio <laughs> and they had gotten so angry with me that they hung up and yeah. they just cut the interview. So in my mind, I'm thinking it was some plot from the Westboro Baptist Church yeah. to screw up my transplant. It was it was absolutely fascinating. Well, I had to when I got home, I was very frail and very sick. Yeah. And I had to go through a, a couple of months of occupational therapy. I had to basically learn to walk and balance myself again. Right. It was really tough. And when the doctor finally gave me the go ahead to work, part-time, I decided, you know what, I'm going to go to work. I'm, I used to be a political analyst. I was a political talk show host. I had my hunting and fishing TV show, and I couldn't hunt anymore because I can't be exposed to the bacteria. Yeah. I, I decided it was time to give back, and I went uh, here to OBI and, and applied for a job in our contact center. And I was just making calls, yeah. talking to people about the blood donation, the importance, and scheduling folks. Well, eventually my doctor told me that I could work full-time. And so I, I went full-time. I was promoted to supervisor of projects mm-hmm. and education. And I was doing the hiring for the contact center and interviews and doing the training. And the opportunity came up to work in what we call recruitment. And that's where we put together blood drives in different areas. Now, I interviewed for the position and I got the position. My territory right now runs from like Piedmont down to almost Chickasha, west of I-44, but not as far out as El Reno, if that makes sense. Yeah, yeah. Um, So I I had told my, they asked me to share my story with our supervisors, our phlebotomy and our donor services department. And I had done so. And during this, this speech, at the end, you know, they, they had said they had a gift for me. And so they gave me this coffee cup. And, and I mean no offense, but it's really pretty ugly. It is not. A, I, my, my dog, my dachshund, could probably have created a better looking <laughs> coffee cup. And so, but of course, I have to be nice. And say, oh, this is so wonderful. Yeah. Well, well, they said to me, well, wait a minute. We, we have another gift for you. And this young man... Mm-hmm. And his whole family in tow, his parents and grandparents and sister, came walking forward. His name's Mason O'Hara. He had donated blood right after his 16th birthday. It was his first blood donation. And his blood saved my life. Wow. And so we got to meet each other. And now we're friends on Facebook. And we have developed this really cool kind of relationship yeah. and uh, we did some TV appearances this week and I think we're going to be doing some more but uh, to talk about you know he, he was sharing his story about he was nervous as heck donating blood the first time mm-hmm. um, but then it, it you know it took him about 10 minutes but then to get to meet me and to share 
our experiences together. I mean, we've gone and spoke together. It's it's just a neat experience. And now he and I are close, and his parents are close with yeah. me. And and uh, if he's acting up, you know, I talk to his parents. And, you know, we, we exchange messages right. on Facebook and that kind of thing. So it's it's a lot of fun. Yeah, he, he's a great kid. Uh, he's going to be at our All American Drive this weekend. Um, and I'll be there with him, you know, as he donates. I can't donate because of the medication that I take. Sure. So um, he's just a great kid. Yeah. Just a great kid. And so, I mean, I'm an example. And Father's Day is coming up. All right. And I have two of my daughters, both of my daughters are getting married this year. Mm -hmm. And if it weren't for that sacrifice of time that Mason made and others, mm -hmm. I wouldn't be able to attend. I wouldn't be here. So uh, some would say, well, you know, it, it, it's a double-edged sword. I'm here because, and now that I've, you know, experienced this, my filter is just gone. And I, I have a zero tolerance for, for any kind of BS. But um, some people would say, well, it's too bad that he survived. <laughs> but my kids are happy. And I, and I get to uh, be at my daughter's wedding this year. Yeah. And I'm excited about that. I'm yeah. very excited about That's that. That's really special, no doubt. It, and for, I mean, for Mason, it, is there, was there a reason that he was only, it was he was 16? Is there like a, a certain age limit? Yes. In okay. order to donate blood, you have to be 16 years old. Gotcha. Uh, with parental permission. Mm -hmm. Now, some schools will allow them to donate without parental permission if they're 17. Sure. If you're 17, our rules are if you're 17 and above, you can donate. Yeah, yeah. Um, some of our high schools, and education takes up about 30% of our blood supply right now. Right. Um, some schools still require, if you're attending school, you have to have your parental permission. And I sure. get that. And yeah. that's that's great. Um, and our schools are amazing. And, and the irony is this young man went to UConn High School. And that's one of my accounts. Yeah. I mean, it's just this weird kind of God thing where where not only did he donate blood to save my life, but he went to school at one of the schools that I handle. Yeah. So, I mean, it, it's been a wild experience. And we, we are seeing right now, we need those young people. Mm -hmm. We need those first-time donors to experience it. Because sadly, right now, we have a lot of donor apathy. Um, coming out of COVID, mm -hmm. those types of situations, people have kind of gotten into their own box. And thankful, thankfully, we have people like you spreading the message and getting out there and getting in people's faces, as it were, mm -hmm. to talk about, you know, this isn't just an abstract idea. Right. It's not like going to the Goodwill and taking clothes, so, you know, which is the right thing to do. Mm -hmm. It's the right thing to do to donate blood, but it has an impact literally to save lives. And I happen to be an example of that. Yeah. Is there like a like a maximum age? Nope. No. Uh, no, nope, not at all. Yeah. I have a, a a gentleman who comes to one of my drives, and I think he's been donating for almost fifty years. Yeah. And I think he's in his eighties. But what's funny about this guy? He's he's the typical get off my lawn kind of guy, right? So he, he has a thing about nutter butters. Okay. He loves them, and. He'll come to my drive, and he doesn't even bother to check in. He just walks right over to the snack table, and if I don't have Nutter Butters, he'll leave. So <laughs> for, my, <laughs> for my drives, I make sure that we have Nutter Butters. So got to have those cookies. So yeah. there is no age limit. People can be 80, 90 years old. Mm -hmm. The only restrictions are some travel restrictions, some medication. For example, myself being a transplant patient, mm -hmm. Uh, I take anti-rejection medication, and I can't donate because of that. Right. Some heart medication, for example, uh, some arthritis medication, but generally, those are the only really re restrictions. Yeah, yeah, yeah. One of the, the reason I asked the age questions, one of the guys that comes to mind who's done a lot with the Oklahoma Blood Institute is, is previous Governor George Nye. Oh, yeah. And I interviewed him a couple of months ago, and, and he talk, spoke a lot about it. And, you know, he has obviously been very vocal about donating as well, which is kind of cool to see. Well, he's a good man. He's we may not agree. Now. Right, right. Yeah. He and I may not agree on everything politically. Yes. Yeah. But at the same time, he's a great man. And we just recently had uh, kind of a contest down at the, at the uh, state capitol, the House and Senate. And mm -hmm. we had an amazing turnout. Uh, there, there are a lot of House reps like Brian Hill who— 
uh, out in Yukon, he'll come to the drives in Mustang and say hello. And he'll, he's a donor. And, uh-huh. and it's good to see that support. There was a bill that was passed last year uh, that now that we helped push through yeah. that allows businesses for their closed blood drives to get a tax credit mm-hmm. for each donor. So we're, we're out there just trying to get new people to donate. We'll do whatever it takes. Right. And thankfully, Governor Stitt did sign that bill, and it's now law. Yeah. If you host a blood drive, it's a private drive just for your company. You can get a tax credit for that yeah. for each employee who donates. Yeah. And for small business, that's a big deal. That's a, Yeah, no doubt. I mean, any incentive to save money on taxes is great, right? Especially when <laughs> you're days. saving lives. It's now, we, maybe we should start giving away gasoline at our blood <laughs> that drive, That is right? the next one. Yeah, that's yeah. the next question. Gas current. Hopefully it stops climbing. This is crazy. Uh, well, I guess people in California now, they're probably like, you know, they just bought the gas price with them, didn't they, when they moved here? Yeah, they, uh, they, yeah, they would love these gas prices. Right. But, and I've, I've traveled to California. I've spent some time out there. And I have a son in uh, Washington State, and he lives right on the coast. And he's like, wow, I'd, I'd love to have your gas price. <laughs> And <laughs> bless his heart. Yeah. But, but uh, it's it's very expensive to live yeah. out on the West Coast. Going 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 back a little bit to talk a little bit about kind of more like your story and stuff. Mm-hmm. Why why the Navy? Why did you go in the Navy from Seattle? Well, it was interesting. My, my father was Army. Mm-hmm. Um, all of my uncles had served in one capacity or another. Um, I grew up in Seattle, yeah. and there at Bremerton Shipyard, they had the USS Missouri, which is where the uh, Japanese had signed their surrender. Mm-hmm. And so you can tour the Missouri. And I think I was about seven years old, and we got to tour it. And I looked at that play. I just was fascinated by it. And I made the decision, at seven years old, I'm joining the Navy. Now, my father was kind of not super happy about that because, you know, he's an Army guy. But uh, I did have one of my uncles who were a Navy veteran. And from that point forward, a lot of my life kind of revolved around that. Um, at the age of 12, my mother was diagnosed with cancer, and they had misdiagnosed it. Um, it was terminal. And so for two years, I was 12, 13, I was helping her change colostomy bags. And it was hard. You know, what 13-year-old wants to change colostomy bags? Mm -hmm. But it was my mom, and we were exceptionally close. I played in band, and I played football and baseball, and she was at all my games. Um, And before she died, you know, I had told her, I'm joining the Navy. And so that had just stayed in my head. And... At my 17th birthday, I signed what's called a delayed entry program. So at the age of 18, I could go in. Mm-hmm. And, and, I, and I did. It was an amazing experience. I, I loved every bit of it. I've been to Africa. I've been to Singapore. I've been to the Philippines. It's, I've been to Hawaii a bunch of times. It, Australia. Um, and that's, there's, that's a whole story in and of itself. But it's, it, it was an amazing experience. Yeah. And, and there are days I miss that ocean. I miss the calmness of the sea. But then again, my hearing has been impacted because of working on an aircraft carrier. <laughs> so, so I do have some hearing loss, but it, I, I say it was worth it. Yeah. Yeah, I mean, I, I haven't experienced any of that. But, like, I imagine wake, waking up in the morning and all you see is the sea and the sky. Oh, it's fascinating. Well, then again, remember, on an aircraft carrier, yeah. you've got 4,000 people on this thing. Yeah. And, and I think I went one time three weeks without seeing sunlight. Jeez. And you, and you lose track of time. Yeah. yeah. You're just working. You have things that you have to accomplish. And, and uh, I was... Uh, a firefighter, and you, so you're always busy, yeah. always busy. Things going on, and and there are days even today that I still miss it. Yeah, yeah. So, I, you, so you were a firefighter throughout, or did you? Well, kind no, of change while jobs? I was on the ship, okay. Um, I, I did background checks, security clearances, that type of thing, um, and I volunteered to be a firefighter. Mm-hmm. And some of my colleagues were not happy about it because they were like, "Now, see, they're going to think everybody can do it," but um, I loved it. Yeah. I absolutely loved it. And I served on the security squad uh, when I was stationed at uh, the shipyard in, in Bremerton, um, ironically, where I got to see the Missouri. Yeah. And so I got stationed there. It was really neat. And uh, I was a hospital liaison for a while, too, uh, 
doing debriefing of folks who were getting out mm-hmm. of the hospital, uh, who were being discharged medically, yeah. to ensure that uh, they wouldn't pose any kind of threat or that right. they were going to get out and connected with the VA if necessary. So, I mean, just because it's relevant, I have to ask, what did you think of Top Gun? What did I think of who? The new Top Gun movie. Boy, you really had to go I mean, there, yeah, I mean, it's tight. I, I didn't uh, like live that, right? I didn't like the first one, to be honest with you. Yeah. I mean, I thought it was That's cute and it's fun. Yeah. Um, there, there's a lot that is just incredibly disingenuous. So, But uh, my carrier, the Constellation, was the first carrier, uh, the convention, first conventional carrier to launch and recover those F-18s. Yeah. And, and you know, I'm not a big fan of Scientology. And you, you call me a butthead about it if you want to but that's fine I'm just not a Tom Cruise fan yeah uh, my I, wife isn't. She would refuse to go watch it. Yeah, yeah. yeah. See, like, I, I just I, don't I, care how good the movie is. I don't like Tom Cruise. Yeah, I don't like. Yeah. I don't like. Where he, you know, his wife and. Yeah. Uh, anyway, but that that's a whole different thing. Now I've liked some of his movies, right? But after I really got to to you know did a little research and found out what he is all about. Um, and I saw the the series. I think it was on the Learning Channel um, with I can't remember her name, Leah Remini. Mm-hmm. Um, that I- investigating Scientology. I just man, I can't. I'm not going to throw any more money at this. I'll go watch you know uh, the Minions or something. Yeah. See some kid movie or some depressing chick movie. But the new I, Jurassic Park that's coming out. Yeah, I think yeah. I'm thinking about that, that too. And because I love I, I love the whole cast and crew of that. Yeah. They just interact so well. And you know, it kind of reminds me of my a couple of my exes, the T Rex. <laughs> and stuff. But um, no, I, I just. I just couldn't do it. Yeah. I mean, it's just, it's not realistic. If anybody watches those movies and decide to join the Navy as a result, good for you. But when you get there, it ain't happening there, cowboy. It's not the same thing. Right, so. yeah. You're not going to be flying, flying jets at 10 feet off the ground. Yeah, and, and Top Gun, remember, that is the best of the best. I mean, it is incredibly difficult to become a fighter pilot to begin with. Yeah. And then you have to go to a whole new level of narcissism to be able to be a fighter pilot. And I'm sure you got some pilots the eliciting who will say, I can't yeah. believe Rob like said that. But when you meet them, you'll understand what I'm saying. Yeah. But um, no, I just can't support that. Yeah. I can't. One of my life goals is to go in a fight to jet. I want to experience okay. it. Like I don't care where it is. I would just love to, you know, sit in sit in the back seat one and try not to throw up and yeah. see what well, it's don't like. Eat, yeah, don't eat anything. Don't yeah. I was I had the opportunity to be launched and recovered on an aircraft carrier a couple of times. Yeah. And it's, uh, you go from zero to 100 miles an hour that quick, yeah. and your insides, will, it's probably why I need a liver trim. <laughs> but no, it'll, it'll, it'll jack you up if you're not ready. Yeah. It, it, it's, it's an incredible experience, though. It's an incredible experience. Yeah. So at this time, then, you're in the Navy, you're traveling the world, having mm-hmm. a great time. Where does, like, radio shows and hunt shows and, and media kind of, like, come into that? Well, it's, it's a funny story. I, I just... On the ship, we have our own closed circuit television and radio. And I've been a musician since I was six years old. And we had this little radio program that we did. So people, while you're working, you could tune in. And they asked me, because they said I had a good voice, to to help out with that. And so I'd I'd spend some records and that kind of thing. And then I just got involved in media. well, it just I guess by default. Yeah. I mean, I worked with after I I I'd get, I'd been dischar- I got discharged from the Navy honorably, mind you. Um, what had happened was my youngest, my oldest daughter, was born at the hosp- Navy, Navy hospital in Bremerton. Mm-hmm. Well, she was unattended in the nursery, and she had thrown up and aspirated and collapsed one of her lungs. Mm-hmm. Now I was due to go on a uh, guided missile cruiser. And I was going to be haze gray and underway, as they say, out all the time. Mm-hmm. And we weren't sure what was going to happen with her. We didn't know if she was going to make it. Um, so I made the choice to not re-enlist and, and mm-hmm. work in the private sure. sector. Um, she's great now, obviously, and she's getting married this You'll year. You're walking her down the aisle this year. Yeah, yeah, yeah. it's going to yeah. be a lot of fun. Yeah. But um, And so I went to work in the private sector, and because of my personality— um, and just in my background, uh, I, I I just it was a good fit. Yeah. Because I I, I have wit and uh, I, I I had 
very little filter, but now I have none. But but back then it was you, there were always. They, they, I just enjoyed. I, I catch myself listening to people on the radio or TV. I go, man, they, this this old boy don't know his butt from buttermilk, mm-hmm. and I'm like, he needs to just sit down. Yeah. And so, you know, I had written that column, but I had worked with the Trinity Foundation uh, based in Dallas, and that's what brought me here, working um, with transitional housing, and I wrote polemics mm. for uh, Trinity, and w- which means I would review a sermon of a televangelist, and from a biblical and historical perspective, I, w- I would write this treatise mm. that said, look, this guy's full of crap, and this is why. Right. And in some cases, like in Ohio, I, I-, I presented it to some board of directors of some radio stations, and we were able to get a couple of these scumbags off the air. Um, so I kind of acted as that liaison. Mm-hmm. Um and then, of course, doing the, the and my hunting show, this is a funny thing. I loved to hunt and fish. That was my, I, I love, it was my go-to. But it only started when I came to Oklahoma, which is interesting. But um, I, this whole culture of hunting and fishing. Yeah. You, know, you go to these little towns and you see these banners, welcome hunters. I'm like, oh, my God, this is, these are my people. But um, so I, I would watch these hunting shows and I got frustrated because even these Oklahoma shows, they go to Texas or they go to Kansas or, you know, someplace in, in uh, they go to Michigan. Or, you know, and I'm like, what the hell? There's a lot of great hunting here in the great state of Oklahoma. So my decision was, well, I'm going to create my own show and we're just going to exclusively hunt right here in Oklahoma. Yeah. And so I call it Wild Oklahoma. And we had a women's division. We did, uh, we were the first ever television show to do a women's noodling trip. That was fun. I'm telling you. Oh my it's God. still one of the craziest things I think I've ever seen, right? Is just noodling in general. Like, yeah, well, I, I stayed on the boat. Yeah, Because I, I, I am horrified of snakes. Yeah. And you don't know what you're going to get, but God bless them. You know, they did it and they no pulled fear. up this big 90 pound catfish or six of them. Yeah. And I'm like, bless your heart. I just, good for you. Just born and raised around it. Yes. Right? It's, good for you. Yeah. And so I couldn't do it. But we, uh, I got to go on a hunting trip with Ted Nugent down in Marfa, Texas one time and uh, uh, did a bow hunt for pronghorn antelope. Yeah. So, and then here locally we had, we made, we had a youth division, okay? Wild Oklahoma Youth. And I got this idea to take a bunch of young girls who have never hunted before Mm -hmm. on a dove hunt. Now my daughter, my young, there was, most of them were friends of my youngest daughter. Okay. And my daughter had been with me on a lot of these hunting trips. She learned how to use all of our equipment and everything. So we were out there. We had, for, for every uh, youth, we had two adults. And it was, it was very safe, very controlled environment. Um, but, boy, they loved it. It was just they ate it up. But they had learned that I was afraid of snakes. Yeah. Okay? And my daughter knew how to do the camera. So they decided... God bless them, to put a little fake snake in my bed with me while I was napping. And they filmed it. It was, And, of course, I wasn't afraid to put it on the air. But it was just these kids, to see these kids who normally, you know, these days our, our culture is such that they're playing video games, they're doing that kind of thing on their phones, and just to get them out. And it was, it was a lot of fun. It was rewarding. So that's how I got involved. I just said, look, there's a great things to do right here in Oklahoma. Yeah. We've got great public hunting. And it wasn't just going to these ranches and stuff with high fence hunting. That's not, no, that wasn't our gig. Right. We would go to the public hunting areas during public hunting season and talk about it and say, this is why we're here. And yeah. uh, Canton Lake, for example, is one of my favorites. I love Canton Lake. And the people are so sweet up there. Um, so that was kind of how I got into that. Yeah. And then, you know, with the, the MAPS project, I had written about it, and I just said, you know, these guys are not being honest on either side of the argument. And that's what started my radio deal. Right. And it was funny. I worked with, at the time, it was 
uh, Citadel Broadcasting. You know, you have the Cat and 98.9, Kiss FM and all those up there. And it's funny because, you know, the, the radio guys, a lot of them have fans. And, you know, some of them are women. And, you know, Rick and Brad, the little studs on the Cat. And, and so women would send pictures and stuff. I used to get copies of legislation. And I'm like, really? Am I that Glamorous. ugly? That bad? <laughs> I got that face for radio. Yeah. But I would, they would send me pieces of legislation to to look at. And, you know, I, I would get into it. with. I remember former state senator Kenneth Korn was on the air one day. And he had authored this bill. It was a public safety bill. And it just it was just ridiculous. I thought it was anyway. Yeah. And I had him on the air and talking about this. And I told him, I, I said, point by point, how it was a ridiculous spending bill. And he made the statement, God bless him, well, you can't put a price on public safety, can you? And I said, it just came out, I said, well, my butt sucks buttermilk. That is not, you know, quit your platitudes, yeah. let's look at this pork. And then some of the folks from the, the Bar Association had recorded that and they used it and anyway. But we became friends and I actually took him on some hunts with me. And yeah, Kenneth Corn and I became friends. It comes full circle, right? It's just like, right. how does this work out? But you're right, I think a lot of people, they don't read the bills, right? right. They just, oh, this is passed and, and it goes on Facebook and somebody shares it and then people start yelling and then you have a crowd outside the Capitol. Like right. no one actually reads what, you know? Right, and we Very should. Very few people do anyway. Well, here's, here's the thing, and I, 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 I used to make the argument and I still do. For a lot of our local legislators, mm -hmm. it's the best job they'll ever have. 12 years and you get retirement. Yeah. yeah. Think about it. Yeah. Um, and, and not only that, but there are a handful of elected officials, and I support them, who are in it to, to win it, as it were. They are committed. They're passionate. They believe in the cause. They, they answer to their constituency. They understand. But for the vast majority of them, I mean, you see the same names over and over again. These folks running for office, it's like, really? Really? You know, and they go, well, I am Mr. Conservative, blah, blah, blah. I want smaller government. I said, well, son, you sure like that government paycheck now, yeah, don't exactly. you? exactly. Right, you know. And it's people, a career, isn't it? Yeah, it is. Yeah. And, and, you know, our founding fathers, they've got to be turning over in their graves right now. Because, you know, they, the concept of the citizen legislator is gone. Yeah. You know, they, what they would say is, you know, you go do your gig, do your public service, and then go back to work. Mm -hmm. Go back to your rent, go back to your farm, go back home, do your own thing. Yeah. Well, and, and, and I know we've got some people running right now um, who are, you know, these religious leaders. And I'm thinking to myself, you know, the only religious leaders that you see in Scripture who were politically motivated were the Pharisees. Yeah. And we all know what Jesus had to say about them. He called them a brood of vipers, you know? <laughs> and I'm thinking to myself, do you really want this? Yeah. So, yeah, I, I mean, there are times I miss politics, but I, mean, <laughs> I don't miss the heartburn and the calls at 2 o'clock in the morning. I mean, I would get death threats at my house, yeah. you know, because I wasn't one of these guys who changed his name on the radio. Right. I kept my name, and so at the time, you remember landlines? Mm -hmm. You know, I know it's yeah. like phone yeah, booths, yeah, yeah. right? Yeah. You see it in the Smithsonian, but um, I, I, I didn't change my name. My number was public, and they threatened me. I said, yeah, well, I'm gonna come over and shoot you, and blah. I said, well, just be careful, because I shoot back. And I don't miss very often, so it drove my ex-wife crazy. Yeah. But, um, yeah, it was, it was, it's an experience. I mean, when you look at what we do here at the Blood Institute contrasted with, you know, and right now we're in the middle of it, aren't we? Mm -hmm. You see every other commercial is some, and, and the buzzword, I'm conservative. Yeah. And most of them couldn't, probably haven't even read the Constitution, let alone, you know, I want prayer in school. Really? Yeah. Are you sure you want prayer in school? Because if you do that, we're a constitutional republic, we have to let every form of prayer in school. And frankly, I think that, that dog don't hunt. You don't want that, Mr. Conservative Christian Pastor Boy, who's never had a decent job. You know, there are, I, I support the guys who sign the front of the check, not the back. You know, these business owners, these folks who have experience in understanding that, hey, we're all struggling. We got to do something with the budget. I mean, we have the highest paid here in Oklahoma. We have the highest paid part-time legislators in the country. 
And remember, these are part-time legislators. They're not supposed to be there at the right. Capitol all year. They're just getting paid. Like Billy Joe Bob the lawyer is supposed to go back to his law firm during the summer. But no, these cats, man, they're, they're in it to win it, man. They stay. They will re They want to retire. Yeah. With that. So and what I got frustrated with is uh, there's folks who, I guess, run for office who are absolutely perfect for that position. But then, they, and they'll say, this is my job, this is what, then they turn around and run for higher office. And they use their previous campaign money to do that. Uh, it's, it's incredibly frustrating. Yeah. Incredibly. But, you know, again, getting back to every now and then, the light bulb clicks for them. Mm. Like with our Senate bill that Governor Stitt wrote for people donating blood. You know, these businesses, they let their people go. Now, there are some, for example, a tinker who will give their employees like four hours off. You know, you donate and then you go home. You can you do whatever you want. You can use your flex time for whatever you want. Yeah. Um, but they, 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 get, they clicked and they said, OK, this is a good thing to do. Let's reward those businesses uh, who are willing to do that. And that's one of the things that I'm proud of that here at OBI, among many things, that we've able to accomplish is say, look, it is literally a life-saving right. hour of your day. And we do that on purpose. You know, it's like, here, we want to save lives. We want to improve the quality of life. Um, and these businesses, some of the legislators, they got it. You know, it clicked. And they said, we're going to pass this. And Governor said, you know, thankfully, regardless of what you think about him, he signed that bill. And that was a good piece of legislation. One of the best, I think, that we've had. Yeah. How do you, I mean, I'm fascinated of like, I, I, the reason I do this is I love seeing people's journeys, right? And how they navigate through life and how, what turns they've taken, you know, some of them have been ones they wanted to take. Some of them were kind of forced. But how they end up where they are and then how they use their past to improve. And, and you know, so I'm curious to know, like, of all the things that you've done, how are you using everything that you've done to benefit OBI and, and you know, the job that you have now? Well, it's... Because you've done a lot. Yeah. I, I'm tired, but <laughs> there are days when I don't even want to get out of bed. But I know, I, re I remember... I keep a picture of what I look like on my phone mm -hmm. when I was in that ICU. I, I looked like a Holocaust survivor. Yeah. And I also do some volunteer work for LifeShare. And I know what keeps me motivated is I know that right this second, we have patients in our local hospitals who are going to need that blood. Mm -hmm. And if we don't get our job done at OBI, it's going to cost somebody potentially their life. And so to me, that's, you want to say, what have I done? Other than, you know, my children, obviously that's a hell of an accomplishment that they've survived in spite of having me as their father. Um, <laughs> but knowing that we are, I'm part of a team whose mission is to be a lifeline between donors and patients. That's what keeps me going. You know, there are days when we're in a blood appeal and we're struggling because we have donor apathy and things like that. And there are days where you just feel defeated. But then you'll get a message about some kid who was in the hospital whose life was saved because of our work. And, and then it just all goes away. Mason, for example, O'Hara, he and I, you know, doing the TV little circuit with him this week, it really, it, it just, everything comes full circle. And you see not only an individual who's excited about donating blood and saving lives, and then being friends with someone whose life he saved. Mm -hmm. It's just that's what keeps me going, and that's the accomplishment that I look at. Sure, being in a nonprofit world is not easy. Yeah. You know, we are a nonprofit. You're you're not going to see us, you know, driving around for our company vehicles as a bunch of Escalades. We got these Dodge vans. You know what I'm saying? We yeah. we we are good stewards of what we try to accomplish here and what we're given. We're we're blessed to be in the position that we are. Um, our CEO has good vision. We've created a program called the Blood Emergency Readiness Corps, and we work with I think 35 other uh, blood you know independent blood uh, banks throughout the country. That when we have these emergencies. 
we have these moments where there's a, a serious trauma. We activate what we call Burke, and we have drives and we rotate who's basically on duty that week. And the people of Oklahoma, whenever we have a, a, a trauma or something where we say we really need blood right now, they come, they show up. And, and our CEO, Dr. Armitage, he realized that during COVID, we're going to have these issues with there was a shooting in, in the blood bank that was in that area a couple of years ago. They, they didn't have enough blood. So they had to reach out to us and other blood banks. And so uh, Dr. Armitage decided, you know, let's go ahead and make this thing happen mm -hmm. and create this network. Now, keep in mind, over 90 percent, I think close to 98 percent of the blood that we receive goes to local hospitals. 90 percent, 98 percent of the hospitals use our blood. Mm -hmm. I mean, obviously, I'm an example of that. Yeah. You know, when I'm sitting in the hospital, the tubes hanging all out of me. And uh, there's a whole nother funny story with that. But um, you, that's what I, that's my accomplishment. Uh, I won a bunch of awards when I was in the Navy, and that was great, and I loved it. I, serving my country is a big deal. Most people know better than to you know mess with the flag when they're around me right. because we're, we're going to have issues. Yeah. I know after hunting Oklahoma, I know places in southeast Oklahoma, they'll never find a body. I mean, I'm just kidding. But but I'm just saying, you know, you get down there in Hanobi Creek, old Bigfoot's going to come up and get you. But Yeah, that's another conversation, too. Is that's it real a or not? different one. <laughs> yeah, but, yeah, but you know, I'm just saying th these are— things that I look at every day mm -hmm. here uh, at, at OBI, and it gets frustrating. There are times where, you know, you have this blood drive, you think you've created this perfect thing, and you have five people show up. Or, or you'll get a snowstorm. <laughs> Or, or, you know, we'll have torrential rain yeah, every, and every. flooding down the street of Mustang, you know, and, and those things. But then, you know what? We just pick it up, and the next day, we just keep going. Mm -hmm. Because there's those patients at the hospital. You know, I, I go up and, and give the nurses on the seventh floor at Integris mm -hmm. here in Oklahoma City. I'll take donuts. I'll take a pizza or something. Because they were amazing. And, and here's a funny story. I'm not going to say the school, but I was speaking to these high school kids, yeah. right? And we were talking about the importance of blood donation. And one of the football coaches come walking in. He's former Air Force. And he's like, oh, I gave my time. When I was in the Air Force, I was donating blood all the time. And I said, well, I'll tell you what, coach, you got a little bit of time. This is for all these kids that I just got pumped up about donating blood. Yeah. And he's a, he's peeing on it, yeah, right? Yeah. I'm like, oh, coach, I'm going to have to choke you. But I said, all right, in front of all these kids, I said, coach, will you give me an hour of your time? Yeah. And he said, sure. I said, well, let's go get in my van. I want to take you up to the hospital where there's a young man awaiting a kidney transplant, mm -hmm. and he's receiving blood products right now, and it's keeping him alive. He signed up to donate blood. He said, he said right. okay, I get it, I get it. I don't want to be faced yeah. with that reality. Yeah. You know, so uh, I, I tend to be pretty passionate. Even on my, my evaluations, one of the things that I get gigged on is sometimes my colleagues aren't as excited yeah. about it and have the personal investment. And so I'm like, come on, why aren't you working 12 hours a day? But um, so they say, Ron, you're a little... You're, you're a little overzealous. Yeah. You know, I'm like Peter cutting ears off in the garden, you know. <laughs> what, you're not going to donate? Well, I'll take it from you. Yeah. But but uh, it, it's rewarding, man. You know, we, every day we wake up and we have a new mission. We we have a new life to save. And, and not only save lives, we're, we're doing great research mm -hmm. here. And we were one of the first blood banks to do convalescent plasma mm -hmm. for during the onset of COVID. And it feels really, really good to be a part of that yeah it's amazing how we find our callings right like yeah. you go through life right and you know like you live in seattle you go in the navy and like, this is my calling you know and right. then you know family's involved and then how it works out and you know now now you're here and it's yeah. it's amazing i love it um for well, people well, good well i play in a band also yeah like, here locally. How, okay, tell me about that how did like why was music such a big thing in your life growing up well it, it just was my mother was very musical okay. and um she had an amazing voice, and she could sing like nobody's business. But uh, it was just, it started off as just something to do when I was, you know, in second grade. And then it just caught hold. Mm -hmm. 
and I've done it my whole life. I, I, I played in the symphony in, in, in school, and and then marching band. I marched with Black Watch Drum Beagle Corps, and and then when I joined the Navy, I switched from horn to guitar, and it just kind of stuck. And and here's you know, fast forward to today, I'm in a band where. Our lead singer is also a transplant recipient. Yeah. Uh, Dan and I, you know, one of our, we work with LifeShare, and we always, we'll, we'll get those little bracelets that talk about being an organ donor or being a blood donor, and we'll just hand them out at our shows because we're not shy about it. You know, <laughs> because right. we're here, we're alive, because somebody donated blood or somebody took the time, you know, to, to, to check that little mark on their, their driver's license. So the two of us have become very close as a result of that. That's awesome. And I don't care. I'll, I'll plug blood drives yeah. from the stage. I, you know? Yeah. <laughs> so, what type of music do you guys play? We play everything. We joke. We play everything from, like, uh, Keith Urban to Evanescence. Right. I mean, we run the spectrum. We play uh, what gets people up dancing. Sure. You know, some classic rock. We play some contemporary country. We play uh, some dance music uh -huh. and and a couple novelty songs, too. You know, yeah. Just to the have classics, fun. The classics. Yeah. Get, yeah. Oh, yeah. You, you, there's always a handful of songs you know that are going to get people on their feet. Absolutely. Right. Yeah, we look at it not only as an outlet for us, but it's also a business. When when you're mm -hmm. when a band is brought in to play and perform somewhere, you need to get people dancing because the more they dance, the thirstier they get. The thirstier they get, the more they spend. Yeah. So we understand the business aspect of it mm -hmm. as well. But really, we have fun. We're not in it for the money because bands in Oklahoma, you know, much, you're not getting, you know <laughs> the, the joke is, you know, who loads up five thousand dollars worth of equipment to go play a, a, a four-hour gig and get paid a hundred bucks. You know? yeah. Well, that's us. Right. Yeah, <laughs> it covers gas money, We're those maybe. guys. Yeah, it, yeah it's, a, it's that kind of that release. So that's why music is so important to me, because yeah. it's a release mm -hmm. for me. Yeah, so. yeah, it's important for people to have that. For me, it means golf for me um, sometimes. Sometimes it works the opposite way. Uh, well, see, I, I play golf. Yeah. I used to be a golfer. I wasn't good. Yeah. There was a guy from Ireland who who played in the pro am who opened up a, 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 a custom golf club shop mm -hmm. in um, Columbus, Ohio, and we became yeah. friends. And he, I spent like a thousand dollars on this set of clubs. I think he shaved maybe yeah. eight eight off of my. That's cheap now as well. Yeah, that was in today's good. money. That's cheap. Back then, it probably yeah. wasn't. Yeah. yeah, but this is you know this is back in you know, the uh, early uh, uh, early nineties. Yeah. And, and so I would play golf, and we'd go out, and I just really wasn't good, even with the clubs. And, you know, I, got, I shaved about eight points off my handicap, but I, I'm i that guy. Yeah. I wrapped my nine iron around a tree at this golf club, and that was it for me. I yeah. said, I'm not playing this game anymore. It's, I, I can't. I don't have the patience for this. Right. And I... Yeah. I got lucky. I started when I was like super young. So really like I was never, you know, I never really cared so much about failing because you're just out there having fun. And then when the right. time I did start to care, I was actually decent at it. But the people who start when they're 30 or, you know, like I, I don't know. I don't know how they have, I don't have patience. I don't know how they have the patience to try and get learn now you right. know, or 40 or however old they are. Like that is hard work. That's like learning a language. It is. I, you know, my first, here's what happened. My first time out on the golf course, yeah. you know, I had done uh, plenty of the driving ranges, but my first, I got a birdie on the, I mean, and I was like, oh my God, I'm if, hooked. I, if I can do this, yeah. and golf I was easy. hooked. Yeah. And I, next thing I know, I'm just throwing out cash. It did, yeah. I got the, the custom shoes and the, I looked, you know, I looked <laughs> ridiculous. I wore the ugly plaid shorts and all this crazy stuff. Yeah. Had the stupid beanie and all that, but I just really kind of sucked, yeah. and there, I just couldn't get it. And finally, I just busted my nine iron around the street. I said, "Yeah, I guess I, this is not helping. Yeah. This is supposed to be relaxing. Yeah. It's not relaxing. Not one bit. Yeah, <laughs> definitely." Um, finishing up, then obviously OBI is a huge part of your life, um, and, and others and family as well. Uh, for people listening, you know. This is this is the call, right? Give them give them the call out. Obviously, 
listening to 45 minutes that you clearly stated why they should get involved but what's kind of like the current call and, and how do they get involved how do they find blood banks and, and well, it's be in, pretty, get in touch we've made it really really easy for folks who are interested in donating blood you just go to our website obi.org there's a button if you want to go to a blood drive you can click on this orange tab that says find a blood drive and you put in your zip code and there will be all these different blood drives at different times at different locations mm -hmm. um, or you could go to our brick and mortar uh, locations like here in Oklahoma City we've got one in Edmond we've got one over by uh, Integris we've got uh, Norman it's we've got them all over the place and so it's a great opportunity just go to obi.org find the blood drive you want to go to mm -hmm. or Schedule an appointment at one of our, uh, our our locations at our blood bank. So we have the one down by the Capitol, 901 uh, North Lincoln. You can yeah. go there as well. Um, the key is just doing it. Right. Yeah, people are afraid of needles. You know, what cracks me up is you see these guys with, you know, these tattoos are tatted up. Oh, I'm afraid of needles. I'm like, man, come on. Yeah. Really? Just don't, don't be on my back I, I just can't me watch raining. it. Like, I can have it, but I, don't, I, I, I am one of those people. I don't like needles, I, but I don't watch. Right, like I yeah. just turn away, you yeah. know. Like, and I've always been. And then it's just from one bad experience where a doctor couldn't find a vein, and right. I was just jabbing at my arm. And I'm like, please <laughs> leave me. Either you're a trainee and you're really trying to fool me right now, or you like my veins aren't that bad to find. Right, he's like, doc, go get your phlebotomist. Yeah, exactly. You're, like, figure you're this a doctor. Out. You're not supposed to be doing this anyway. Yeah, figure well, this stuff out. I mean, we have great phlebotomists, and, and our folks. And if you're a first time blood donor, we really need you, and yeah. we want to make sure that that first time donor has a good experience. Mm -hmm. um, and just let them know you're a first-time blood donor. And, I mean, we, we take care of everybody. Yeah, yeah. But we'll pay particular attention to folks. Mm -hmm. I recommend you drink a lot of water before yeah. you go donate. Eat an iron-rich meal. Stay hydrated. Those are all very, very important. Yeah. I what about to, people who want to listen to, who want to meet you or chat to you or have had a similar experience, <laughs> want to talk about politics? I mean, we're, <laughs> you, well, you mentioned can, a Facebook page. Yeah, you could go. Uh, well, you could go to my Facebook page. Just look up Ron Black, the artist formerly known as the 400-pound gorilla of Oklahoma <laughs> media. Uh, <laughs> and uh, ronblackradio.com is my website. I haven't updated since my transplant. But um, you, you, can, you can find me here at OBI. Just yeah. give us a call. And if you want to come out to one of the drives you know, and meet me or talk, uh, I've got folks who used to listen to my radio show who come out to donate blood. Yeah. And we have a moment, and we, we post it on Facebook and, and yeah. all that as well. Talk about hamburger meat and eat nut yeah, butters. Oh, my God. You did go there. <laughs> oh. We'll have to finish there. Thank yeah, you so yeah. much, Ron. It's been an absolute pleasure. Uh, for people listening, I'll put the links in the description. And obviously, you know, the importance of, of OBI. Uh, you've just listened to 50 minutes of it, and, and Ron is an example of that. So it's serious. We need blood. And I'll put the links in the description, and we will catch you next episode. Cheers. This podcast is presented by the Oklahoma Hall of Fame, telling Oklahoma stories through its people since 1927. Follow them online at OklahomaHOF.com and definitely on Instagram at OklahomaHOF. Thank you for listening. We are inspired by those around us and hope that you are too. Make sure you subscribe to this podcast on your favorite podcast platform and leave us a review so we can keep telling your stories. For more great Oklahoma content, follow This Is Oklahoma on Facebook and Instagram.